Wait, so wait. Yeah. Sort of thought well, our big leader was going to be here today, but I. <laughs> not, I would not be surprised. <laughs> but I did tell him I would be here just to, to fill in to make sure. I'm sorry? I heard he will be here around 11. Uh, I don't know anything about tomorrow, so you would probably have a question about that. So that's when I tried to use Metro. Oh, well. Hello, say guys. We have two groups today, so we have to go with everyone and hope that the sound is not going to be a problem. It's me when I move closer to the listening. I can hear all that. There's lots of people here. So it looks like Greg can't be here today, so I'll be the almighty introduction here. Um, well, <laughs> I looked at the rain and thought, well, going in. I wonder if it's going to be a lot of people today or not. I don't know what it is, but even when you're in a car, it tends to keep people away, even if it's just water coming down. <laughs> but this is a pretty good um, talk we have here. Uh, uh, Glenn is going to talk to us what's called DevOps in the, in the industry. It's a buzzword that everyone's using. It's definitely a hot item out there for a lot of companies trying to be all DevOpsy. Uh, so I think you're, you're trying to demystify what it is and try to describe what it is and how to use it. So unless there's anyone that has any kind of things you want to bring up, um, maybe now is the time. Looking for a job or people have jobs to advertise or anything like that to the group before we get started. Yeah, my name's Sean. I'm one of the partnership officials. Uh, we're still hiring. We like what we talked about. We don't call it DevOps there. It's a buzzword, but it is kind of a DevOps position, if you will. Uh, we also have front-end uh, and back-end job development. Uh, so we're still looking at that. We can follow up with our job. We're going to see the contract with Greg's there at the end of the day. If you know anybody who's interested in the contract, don't do that. <laughs> also, uh, Covera is the company I work for, uh, is hiring as well, and we're looking for DevOps type people, but mostly we're looking for smart people. Um, we have a wide range of business, even though we're a medium, small, medium sized company. Uh, my card's on the table. Uh, feel free to drop me a line or contact us online. Anyone else have anything to announce? Anything you want to bring up before we get started? I'll take a look, Glenn. Okay. <clears throat> um, this presentation I've given several times uh, at conferences, other user groups, et cetera, et cetera. It's focused on continuous integration and delivery and that side of DevOps. So I'm going to go into explaining what it is. And basically, what I have here is the centerpiece of the presentation is a demo I created to showcase what DevOps might look like when it takes form in the real world, right? So I'll go over some of the theory about DevOps, but mostly I'm gonna go right into the demo. Feel free to stop me at any time to ask any questions you have. 
Also, this is the first time I've presented to this group. I don't know if you guys have any uh, ritual or rules or whatever, but if I'm doing something wrong, just nudge me in the right direction. Very informal. So. Very informal? Okay. Um, and that's it to start. So first off, uh, give you agenda, but one thing that's not on the agenda is who am I? Uh, Sometimes I don't have to give this because uh, the people know who I am, but my name is Glenn Buckholz. I've been working in the software industry for approximately 15, 16 years. Uh, and I've done all sorts of work, mostly around configuration and man configuration management and deployment in the early days, and now more towards uh, operations and DevOps. Uh, I'm currently employed by Caveros, and I work in the current contract as a consultant. I work for the Department of Worldwide Security, or the immigration side of things, and we're trying desperately to digitize the three part process and any other paperwork associated with becoming a citizen. Um, very interesting project. A lot of what you've seen here has been applied there with great success. Uh, so I'd be happy to tell you real world instances where we've applied this technology and have seen great benefits. So just really quickly, I'm going to go over what I did, what it's good for. Uh, I'm going to show you the demo. I'm going to try to do a live demo. If that doesn't work out, I have a video uh, that I'm just going to talk through. Uh, the architecture of all the pieces that are in play, uh, the workflow of what actually is happening and what's going on through each step, uh, this idea of orchestration and what it means in the DevOps world, um, a little bit of a spiel about cost versus velocity, uh, data analysis, why it's important in the DevOps world, what you're looking for, what to do. Um, and basically, uh, what Caveras is doing with this technology for its customers. So this is direct things that I have implemented for people, and they have given me money to do it. So they thought it was valuable. <clears throat> so what did I do? I combined several technologies that Caveras is familiar with, plus Puppet and. The demo has grown, so now it includes Chef and the principal, uh, to demonstrate all implementation of continuous integration and continuous integration. This could be titled, Everything I Wanted to Do at Forge.mail, which was a test contract in one, but was not allowed. And mainly, we had a lot of security restrictions because it was a DOD contract, so we couldn't do any of the cool stuff. So as an outlet, I just did this on my own. And it got a lot of traction internally, and we've actually used it for customers in the years since. Uh, specifically, I cobbled together Jenkins, Puppet, a Puppet Master, EC2, uh, Linux was the OS of choice, and Perl and Ant um, to get this demo going. The demo has evolved and uh, had some future directions, which we'll talk about at the end of the presentation, which we're actively, actively looking for. I know Linux. I don't know most of those other things. Okay, so no problem. Um, so DevOps is this idea of engineering your release process. I'm going to directly answer that question. Is this idea of engineering your release process? So currently, or at least in the many years of experience that I've had in the software field, doing a software release uh, was a heavily person-driven function. You may have scripts, you may have RPMs, you may have things that are done for you or automated, but there's some guy at the keyboard gnashing the keys to actually take version 1.0 and upgrade it to version 1.2, right? So DevOps is the idea of instead of having really knowledgeable systems guy doing that upgrade, have him engineer it instead. And there are a lot of benefits. Now, the engineering of this is fairly new, and some, some people say I've been doing it that way for years, but to the industry as a whole, this idea is fairly new, um, maybe four or five years old. Um, and these are some of the tools that enable that. Jenkins is basically a job, uh, it has really cool GUI, and it's a job scheduler. It does stuff. So Jenkins do this, Jenkins do that, and it will run and execute a set of programs, tasks, and do stuff, and it's very general. 
we just choose to use it for building, mostly building software and deploying that software to some environment. And basically, it's the hub. It's the aggregation point, the information radiator. That's where you go to kick things off, and that's where you go to look at most of your data uh, to see how things have gone and collect metrics. And so it's a dashboard and a job. Puppet and Puppet Master, um, you know, we'll be more broad. Three technologies that are in heavy use today are Puppet, Chef, and Ansible. There are more, uh, Capistrano, a few others, but these are basically the tools that you use to automate your software deployments. So instead of logging on to the box and typing, you know, if you happen to be in the Red Hat world, yum update or yum install, or maybe even untarring a bunch of war or gear files into Tomcat's directory. You all, you, Chef and Puppet provide a very high-level set of facilities to do that really quickly in a regular manner um, that is scripted so that there's no deviation of what you want and what actually happens. And this becomes important, especially when you're dealing in a world of cloud and clustering where you may have thousands of instances that you are deploying to, and it has to be done the same way every single time. You actually cannot do it by hand anymore if you take a look at people like Google and Netflix. The server base that they're walking, working against is so huge that these tools are important. Even if you're not, even if you're like me, you're only deploying to 40 servers, this becomes really important because it provides, these technologies provide a way to troubleshoot and uh, audit what you've done on your release so that if you're tired because it's three o'clock in the morning and you fat finger step 53 of your deployment instructions um, you know you don't spend five hours trying to figure out that you vi'd something the wrong way um, you can see a change log in every single thing that happens when you use these technologies and that benefit alone is worth using it, even if you're not deploying to thousands of servers. EC2, EC2 is Amazon's cloud virtualization technology, and oh my God, it's cheap. I mean, really cheap. You have to do some stuff to uh, make it do everything that you want, but you can spin up a predefined Linux instance, and it will cost you uh, to pick their smallest size, uh, the first year is free, and you're talking about an instance that's highly available, sits on the internet, uh, directly in a tier one data center, has access to the world, um, and you don't have to worry about the hardware, you don't have to worry about system engineers doing things, you know, it just, it just works. Um, and they provide an extraordinarily rich API for which you can do things programmatically including spinning up virtual machines, tearing down virtual machines, standing up networks, standing up databases. You name it, you can probably do it in EC2. Um, one of the most valuable tools that I've run into in the computer field in the last five or ten years. But those are the two things. It's cheap and it works. Um, Google also has a Google Compute offering, which is very competitive with Amazon has the same sort of time with reliability and scalability, um, just a little bit less rich on the feature set because they want you to do things the Google way, whereas Amazon basically creates a data center as a service. It's like, these are the traditional offerings you could do if you physically stood up a data center. Now you can physically stand up your data center for a web UI. Only it's virtual, I'm not actually putting cages out there, but certainly feels like it when you look at the management costs. Linux, this is the operating system that I am most familiar with and I have worked with since 1994, 95, 96, long time. Um, very hard to convince people in industry in uh, early 2000s that this is the way you want to go. People were still all focused on Solaris if they wanted to do Linux or a couple of other flavors. But in recent years, man, I tell you, it's my dream because it has taken corporate America by storm. Just cost savings, total cost of ownership is so much lower than anything you have to pay a license for. This includes all aspects of open source. As long as you have, it's cheaper 
literally cheaper to pay somebody a yearly salary to maintain it than it is to pay IBM's licensing fees or Sun's or job Oracle's licensing fees. Um, and it's a very hard sell, but if you hire the right people, it is, uh, in our experience, the best way to go. Perl and Ant, Perl is just a command line utility that goes out and gets web pages and spews back the text. Um, this is very useful for when you want to access things on a programmatic level. Um, and you don't want it rendered in a web browser. You just want to pull something from the page to check it out. Uh, it's also very handy when you want to uh, manipulate a REST interface for uh, one of the uh, products we have, either Puppet or Chef. And you can force the Chef server or the Puppet master to do things by using curl. And Ant, Ant is basically a Java-based builds tool. Um, so, I don't know, it's kind of like uh, allows you to build your software in, by specifying what you need to do in XML. And it's heavily Java-friendly or Java-based, but over the years it's been a friend to, been extended to do just enormous things. Um, also, in this demonstration, if I can get the live demo to work, you'll see Maven and a few other things. So that answers the easy thing about the technology stack. Um, any questions? Could you uh, just quickly compare that to Agile development? Well, um, these things are not orthogonal. Agile development is basically a way of self-organizing into small teams at a high level. And DevOps meshes very well with that. DevOps, basically what you're doing is you're putting um, people with more programming experience in charge of also running the application at a very high level. And Agile would be a way to manage your teams um, to do that. You don't have to use Agile, but we do. And we find it highly effective when we mix the two. Is that good enough? Okay. Right. How does QA and QC fit into this? So you'll see, but um, okay, that's fine. I actually specifically address that a little bit later. So I've given you a feel of continuous integration and continuous delivery and the technical aspect of what we're doing, but before we go any further, you might want to ask, well, what is all of this good for? Now, we have some audio issues here, so I'm going to try to do this the best way that I can. Uh, it doesn't work with this can it? But um, there's this idea of failing faster. And I've worked with the people at Extra Credits. It's a uh, video blog for uh, people interested in designing video games, and it really gets into how the industry handled things. And they created a short cartoon, we do a closed captioning, called Fail Faster. And it starts off with, we assume failing faster was the first thing that all uh, developers learned. So it turns out not. He's watched people waste millions. This guy is a very senior game developer. Um, without this lesson getting taught to their developers. So the people are obsessed with trying to make the perfect piece of software. But they lose sight that if you take the fail faster motto, you can bring out the flaws earlier in the life cycle. <laughs> and uh, you always want to iterate towards better. You know, there's no good plan to get there. Um, you want to share your ideas. You want people to be brutal with the ideas or, you know, an automated test framework to be brutal with your code so that you catch all these. Yeah, high-level idea for Mario, plumber on drugs, Sonic, an indigo hedgehog in sneakers. It can run really fast. Years of war, linebackers with chainsaw guns. These are all terrible and all great ideas is what they're trying to say. And they're meaningless unless you put the effort behind them and that effort is headed in the right direction. In case any of you are World of Warcraft fans. But you start, you lay it all out there, and then you course correct as often as possible. And 
basically, uh, you allow to your code, your ideas, open up to criticism faster, and you can take that criticism and do something useful with it faster. So without the audio, that's kind of all I really wanted to get across with the video. So we can pan this and go back to the presentation. This was used with express permission granted to me from the extra credits people, in case you're wondering. I actually emailed them, and they're a very nice group of people. Um, so what I have for you next is an actual live demo of what all this is and how fast or what you into that. Get full screen here. <coughs> so, <clears throat> this is a Jenkins dashboard. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this or not. It's an open so source Java application. Um, there's a little bit of customization that we've done here for this demo. And these are jobs. These are the latest, these are the last jobs that were executed. And these are the jobs that we care about. And here are some customizations that present the information um, in a more coherent manner so that if you're not a development wonk like I am, you're a business wonk, you can actually understand what's going on here. Um, in the real world, we have the specialized views shared with people who actually sign the check. And they grade their developers and us on information that comes from here. So it's serious business, uh, and you have to do it right. So what is this thing? Well, we created this little application. It's a little hangman application. Type in the letters, guess it. Every time you guess wrong, another piece goes on the hangman puzzle. Uh, it's a Java app uh, runs in Tomcat, web-based. Um, so what you can do is you open up your development environment, make a change to the code base. No, I'm not going to do that because I don't feel like getting into Eclipse right now. Has a tendency to go <laughs> real wrong real fast, but uh, I'm just going to force a build. So what Jenkins will do is it will look at our Git repository and it asks, "Are there any changes? Are there any changes? Are there any changes?" Jenkins allows you to point it to specific branches, whatever. In this demo, we're just watching head and we're asking, "Are there any changes?" And eventually, you'll see. code itself is the documentation now how the application released. And this is, is released. And this is very important because it's very reproducible. Um, when you execute this code, you don't have the element of human error. It's very possible that the computer could mess up because it's not configured properly. But typically you figure that out really quickly. So you don't have to rely on the accuracy of your digits. You heavily rely on the code once you get it right. And also, the code does provide, if you're skilled at reading Ruby or Shadow or Puppet, a very detailed view of what's actually going on. And I find that people who have constructed their recipes or their notes correctly, depending on which technology you're using, uh, don't need a lot of documentation because usually it's pretty evident if you're familiar with the technology. Uh, this allows operations people, standard, trusty security types, granting users to, you know, systems engineers. They govern the access to the systems now, and the developers themselves. Remember, if you're using Agile and you have a cross-functional team, you have one of these DevOps guys on your team and he's sitting right next to one of the developers who's cranking out the code. And they're talking so that the DevOps guys knows how to configure the system. Hey, I need access to this REST interface on the internet. Make sure that my proxy is set up correctly and we're doing production. Stuff like that. And they're developing together. And who knows, maybe the DevOps guy, maybe he is really good at C++ or Java. 
and they're cross communicating about how to actually solve the problem the developer is trying to talk about. Too. But the developers from the ground up are now governing. Those development teams are not just checking in code to a repository, handing it off to another group to test it. It's all, they're all working as a cross functional team, and they're responsible for solving the problem, testing the results, and getting it to its final destination. Um, do you have new testing concerns when you do things this way? Now, you have to test code that deploys things, or code that initializes operating systems. Um, Chef does provide a utility to do this called Test Kitchen. It interacts with some sort of cloud or virtual machine provider that allows you to pull up, or a container, if you want to go to the doctor away. Uh, allow you to spool up and tear down instances to see whether or not they're configured correctly. You know, and you have unit tests to make sure this package is installed, this config file is installed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to test whether or not your code is going to be good. But for the most part, those technologies are still, in my opinion, fairly immature compared to some of the UI testing, like Selenium, and a bunch of the other testing frameworks we have. So really, the only way to see if it's going to work is to run it and be good at it. And you have to wait for the testing technologies to catch up with us a little bit more here. So you are kind of going into some untreaded territory. Also, there's this idea of testing an OS template. These templates that you come from, you can make a trade-off. You can either accept what Amazon gives you, or is an Amazon marketplace. I'm not quite sure. You just keep up with the changes that come. Or you can engineer your own and update it on a monthly, quarterly, weekly basis to be right. Engineering it on your own has some advantages, especially if you have a closed off production environment. You can make sure it's connecting uh, out of the box, make sure it's connecting and registering with Chef or Puppet correctly, connecting to your RPM repositories, et cetera, et cetera. You don't have to configure that. It just comes out that way, and then you can lay down the rest of the stack. It can be a huge time saver. Developers now have the job of convincing operations people to run their deployment code. So they've gone from this thing where they're just checking in stuff to get repository going to that test dashboard. It's saying to an operations guy who is the one that has to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning when there's a database failure. Hey, I want to release a new code. And he's like, well, why the hell am I going to listen to you? You just do new and crazy things. Convince me that I'm not going to be up at 4 o'clock in the morning unmigrating this code. I say, hey, look at my test cover. Hey, look at my tests. Hey, so using Jenkins, using that information radiator to convince the operations people that I've done a good job, please release the new version. And that dialogue is very important. So let's just take a look, quick look at this particular demo architecture in terms of virtual boxes inside. You have probably one non-virtual box, the developer's laptop desktop or whatever. And the main form of communication with the system is, in this case, Git, but whatever code versioning utility you want. Um, and Jenkins is constantly calling Git. Also, Git is a good repository for your public classes or your chef recipes or whatever else, just to keep the version. Keeping, keeping your deployment recipes or your deployment uh, code version is very, very important. Um, if you don't, you have a very hard time figuring out what happened when things go wrong. When you automate something, things can go really wrong really fast if you're not careful. So definitely want that auditing in some sort of code repository. Uh, from there, Jenkins builds your code, pushes it to Nexus or your code. Um, Activates the automated testing, so say get ready. And the puppet now starts. You're talking to Jenkins or the chef server, pushes the code out to the cloud, and for every revision, it'll stand up a new stack, push that code out, and then the Selenium test will run against the code. Uh, also, if you have more localized integration and unit testing, that would probably take place on Jenkins or one of Jenkins' slaves. Yeah, but you have this whole structure 
of automated testing that takes place, and all of this is sandbox. This is not going out to production. Production typically will use, at least in our experience, we've set up different hardware or virtual hardware to do the deploys. So once you pass on the gates here, you take the artifacts on the Nexus or you have a you elevate it to the production repository, and then you rerun the deploy scripts from the production puppet master to get all the code across it. Can I ask a question now? Yeah. Where does pen testing fit into that? Do you guys automate any of that, or the security lets you? Yes. So in this demo, all we have is Selenium UI testing. Yeah. But uh, in the past, what we've used are products like OpenVAS, uh, Nessus, and the Open SCAP standard to automatically take a look at the operating system and the application itself. We also use Fortify, WebInspect, all these tools we've integrated with Jenkins to do automatic scanning. And it just is a matter of how much time you want to spend scanning your application. Uh, do you want to do this? every day, every week, every month? Uh, do you want to do this every build? Usually it doesn't pay to do all that scanning any build, every build, because Fortify, for example, can take two days to run. You don't want builds queued up for two days before you can deploy them. So you come to some sort of a balance and you just make sure it's all run before it goes to production. But yes, uh, Jenkins will allow you to automate what is automatable. If a framework doesn't exist for it, though, you do need to engage in manual pen testing. But also, the surface area of what you're testing is smaller because you have run all the automated tests. You know where to focus your efforts. So, yes. Well, there are several things you can do. The Puppet Cloud Provisioner takes care of that for you, and I believe it does a wget or something to uh, just pull down a tar zip file, and then it runs the Puppet installer, there's a shell script, and you know, put Puppet in. And then you do some things to make sure that the node registers. It, the Puppet Provisioner knows how to make the code once it's there register with the Puppet master. Um, what you can also do, well, I'll get that into the end. Uh, Amazon has done some things that change this a little bit. But there are ways that you can do it even faster because that actual registration process and getting the code there can be time consuming because some of these frameworks, they're small, but you know, when you're talking about 50 megs over 1,000 nodes, I mean, that's a significant amount of bandwidth. Anyway. We've gone over the workflow, but really quick, commit code, Jenkins text change, RPMs are built and distributed, Jenkins contacts EC2, spools up the instances, uh, Puppet Master does orchestration, we'll get into that in a minute, confirms the application is running, fires off the automated tests, and upon success, everything is torn down. That bullet point is a little bit of a lot. Right now, I have about four or five or six AMIs just sitting in Amazon, spending my money. I'll get into that in a minute. And failures, but you should, upon successful testing, just tear the instances down. Failures. You want to learn from your failures. So when your tests fail, you want to leave the broken stack there for some period of time so that somebody can dive into it and see what the heck actually just went wrong. And it can be a number of things. But you want that root cause analysis. So I use the code commit to trigger this whole process. The thing you want to take away is that the process itself is engineered and automated. But the thing that triggers it doesn't necessarily have to be a code commit. That's just the best practice that I'm comfortable with. Something has to trigger the testing. The reason I use a code commit is so that a code commit is typically a significant enough change to require some measure of testing. You may or may not agree with that statement. As a matter of fact, if you have a heavily static HTML site and you really don't have a lot of programming going underneath, you may not care to test everything you do there. 
Uh, unit tests are the minimum criteria for publishing a change, typically. You want to follow good test driven development. Uh, even if the code is bad, the system must still run. So, what that means is if I screw up my puppet, or if I screw up my developer code, the application itself, I want to be careful. I want to have done some level of due diligence before I hit the deploy button to make sure that that code doesn't tear down my CI CD delivery stack. Could be an issue. So you do actually want to look for things like, am I manipulating chickens in my code? I probably shouldn't be. Stuff like that. You want to have some sort of safety. My convention code commit should be um, should be complete and significant. This statement seems simple, but it's a change to the way a lot of people do their coding practice in business now. Because people will sometimes treat the code repository as just a place to save their work, whether it's complete or not. But now, every commit has a cost. I just spun up two VMs and used a bunch of CPU time to test this thing. Maybe I ran security scans. I'm consuming resources every time I do a code commit. I either want my gates to fail me out really quick if something is wrong, faster, or I want to be very cognizant about what I'm doing so I don't block the pipeline so other people who are more diligent can get their code to production. This should be enforced by training. There's a human element here. While there's a lot of automation involved in now bringing your code to production, um, you do have to change the behavior. And in organizations, you spent literally weeks or months changing people's behavior to now look at things differently. Code repository is no longer just a dumping ground to say it work. It's a place where you want to put a completed product. That and other behavioral changes. Don't ask me, the DevOps guy, why your code didn't make it to the test environment. Go to Jenkins and look at the information radiator and kind of do some uh, analysis yourself. All of these things are behavioral changes that we've had to institute with our customers in order for them to use this framework effectively. For larger projects with large volumes of commits, potentially instead of a code commit, like if you have 300 developers working on a project, you may want to look at either pre-commit hooks from your SEM repository, uh, if you have that much money and you can just build everything. Some people do. Or you want to look at time. Every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes, you cut a new build and see what happens. So if you remember back in the old days, it's kind of like Tinderbox from Mozilla, only virtual. It's all virtual. You're not asking some guy to donate an IA64 machine to your cause to see if the browser runs and works. School it all up in it. So RPMs and packaging. We are talking about ghost code earlier. <laughs> Certain processes of your development lifecycle now need to become more mature. And as the DevOps engineer, you have to enforce this on your developers a little bit. That said, you should work with them to institute these technologies because many developers are not OS guys. And they don't understand software packaging all that well. They click a button and either Team Studio or Maven or whatever does its magic, and the result comes out the end. Now, I've met some developers who are very diligent too, but when you're talking about the law of large numbers here, a lot of people don't take that into consideration. So, the reason you want packaging is you want to quickly move the code to the different environments in a consistent format. That's very important because your deploys are now automated. Your demands on what the final product should look like are very static. Things have to change within the framework in a way you Copying files too unpredictable and error prone. I have lived through SQLsoft deployments, Java deployments, and it's just a problem. Because people are hand jamming this jar here, this COBOL file there, they don't tell you where they got it from, what it is, and sometimes you have old code that should have been deleted. Also, when you're doing it by hand, you're not thinking about permissions, location, what if you have similar 
that often happens when you do things by hand in the Unix environment. You end up with similar uh, cleanup of old files and basic dependency checking. My package requires these three other packages. Are they installed? I don't know if I untarred them in the middle of nowhere. But if I use something like that dev or RPM or Portage or Merge or Quartz and BSD, I will know because those dependencies will be baked in whatever I'm using. And if you've invested in Gradle or Maven heavily, those dependencies can also be automatically behind for you so you're not hand jamming in there what like system libraries you need. Uh, any of the following are good choices. RPM, the MSI for Windows, do get anything. But use something that tracks the files that are being deployed and controls the format in which they're laid. <laughs> any questions about packaging or why it's important in this process? Next thing that in the DevOps world, you want to look at is your cloud provider. There is more than one. EC2, Amazon, they're just one of the bigger ones. But the main issue that you want to extract from your cloud provider is elasticity. You want to go in there being sure that they can handle the number of servers is going to change on an hourly or minutely basis. And that you need that so that you can run tests massively in parallel to give you the velocity you want so that you can fail faster. Um, also in your cloud provider, you want a way to catalog all your machines. You want to be able to assign metadata to all your VMs. Um, you want the ability to group VMs and link them to your test results. And you want to automatically map code commits to what cloud deployments that they've gone to. And these are things that you should look for in a cloud provider. Amazon and Google Compute provide programmatic ways to tag all of your instances. And it's pretty awesome. I've worked with some cloud providers who don't. And all that you have is a list of a thousand machines, and you got to do a lookup on a chart. And they're not very elastic either. I want a new machine, yeah, that'll be two weeks. Like, well, why am I paying? Um, so, in order for this whole DevOps idea and this continuous integration of the Linux framework pipeline to work, you really want these two items from your cloud provider. Everything else is kind of a nice to have, and if you value it, base your decision based on that. But you kind of need these. You have to have these. Any questions? So let's talk just a little bit about OS templates. Because you're doing things and deploys in a programmatic way, and I personally like the philosophy of what they call disposable computing, each OS must originate with a standard template. You have to know that progenitor instance has to be the same. You have to know what to expect when that template goes live. What does it have access to? Who is it talking to? What can it do? All changes to the template must then be managed by Puppet or some other deployment language. If the OS is not standard, and this, my friends, is from my hard, hard, hard experience and lessons learned. If the OS is not standard, too much time will be spent engineering around OS peculiarities in order for CICD to be perspective. You'll have too many what we call snowflakes out there. You, know, you, need, you don't want that. You want things to be standard. Take the time up front. It pays dividends, I am telling you. Uh, sometimes it's hard to make that business case. Why are you spending a week figuring out the best way to do Yum? Don't we have a Yum framework already? No, it pays dividends. Because now you're standing up hundreds of machines a week and tearing them back down. And the marginal cost of just one manual step in this process is now magnified by 100 or 1,000. CM must be mastered at some level if you're going to do this. Uh, every change to a standard OS must be reported. 
this is important. Rel is a moving target. They do a really good job to ensure compatibility. It's got a lot of money uh, if you use it. All right, so. But things still go wrong. You want to be able to track that I deployed yesterday, everything worked. All I did was update a readme file and triggered another deploy, and today it failed. Wow, it really didn't change the code. But then you go back and you take a look at some of the work the DevOps people are doing, and you see that they applied the next Tuesday patch set to your base rel test. And now one of the libraries isn't, isn't coming up correctly or doesn't work the way it used to or has a different configuration option. And to be able to see that up front will save you days of troubleshooting time. Because people always go to the code or always go to the deployment framework first rather than looking at the OS. But if you have the changes out there in a publicly viewable place, it only takes you a second or two to look. You're likely to find the change faster. Every change to your OS should be programmed. No hand joke. Remember, if you're deploying hundreds of times a day, one manual step becomes extraordinarily expensive. Uh, in all deployments, you should strive to be hands off. The one exception might be production. You may have to do some tricky load balancing if you're not as mature as Google or Amazon uh, to make sure you have very little downtime or whatever. But everything else, hands off. Uh, when you do this, you get your delivery, you almost get your continuous delivery for free. Because like I said, this is dealing with continuous integration in the first part of the pipeline where you're building the code and deploying it. But once you mature that infrastructure, because you're deploying the test your code hundreds of times a day, all you have to do is take a look and say, I just need a little bit of a stripped out version of what I have. I use that same methodology to deploy to production. And really, you should be customizing your OS for only two reasons once you get involved in this. Now, I'm talking about customizing the template that you distribute and use as a preventator instance to everybody else. I'm not talking about customizing the, app, the OS for your application. The template, you really only want to be changing your OS template to integrate properly with Puppet or Jenkins or Chef or whatever deployment technology you're using. But also, whatever integrations you need to make the OS more responsive to your cloud provider or more uh, interact well with your cloud provider. That may include a kernel version, whatever, so it can talk properly to the OS. That's it. Anything outside of that, you want those changes handled by a better chat Because that's what it's about. OS template testing should also be automated. Your OS templates, you do want to do some sort of do diligence before you let it out in the wild. Because if you let out a bad template, you're going to halt your software production for the day until you figure out the problem. So, investing in RHEL or CentOS is, alone is actually a good idea because they spend a lot of time on backwards compatibility. But you also want to do some sort of manual check before you let it out. Also, scan it, do the stake. Scan it. Do the open S test it. Scan it. Do the OWASP top 10. Uh, see what's changed when you do your monthly or weekly updates. So this way you're in front of it, not behind it. You can write that ticket and hand it over to the developers. Uh, maybe it'll be resolved before the code goes to production. Also, organizational standards. Make sure your template can still do your centralized login. Make sure that if your company has Standardized directories or standardized locations for those things. All of those things are taken into account and still healthy after you do your Yub update for the quarter. We talked about this pretty much earlier, so I'm not going to go over it too much, but pretty much testing your deployment code, it's a new area. <laughs> Frameworks have yet to catch up with it, uh, but there have been some great strides. Chef Zero, Test Kitchen, Puppet has a few. Automated testing. So if you decide to go for DevOps and you have your automated delivery pipeline, automated testing now must be brought to your company or your client as an established practice, or they have to mature that practice. 
We could not perform the volume of tests required for CI efficiently without some sort of automated check to separate good changes from bad changes. We just can't. In order to fail faster, we need feedback faster. In order to get feedback faster, we want to automate the feedback we're getting. Because people are slow. They just are. The best manual tester in the world still takes longer to log in than a Selenium script. Because I have to remember their password because of the tech. The cost of practice must be understood within the development testing organization. Often, in my experience as a consultant, it's not. People don't understand the costs and benefits of automated testing, be it unit testing, integration testing. Why am I spending this engineering effort when I can get testers for X dollars an hour and just monthly faster to buy? Uh, why am I spending all of this money on a testing engineer? You have to explain them. You need a lot of people pressing the button in order to keep up with your delivery pipeline. India only has a billion, billion and a half people. <laughs> if you're talking about people on the scale of Google and Netflix, it's not enough to do all of that testing. Testing resources must be able to handle max capacity. So typically, we all have budgets. We all have projected dollar expectations that people above us are pushing down on the engineers. What you want to make sure is that you size your pipeline appropriately, and this is where you may want to do time builds instead of every build for today. Your testing resources to handle everybody committing, everybody you want to make sure that you can handle 30 instances of your application being out and being tested. If you have a private cloud set up, you know, this means you're going to have real world hardware constraints. Heck, even if you're in Amazon, Amazon has soft on their instance types and how many school on and spawn. And unless you negotiate the hard limits with them beforehand, you'll hit it and your whole framework will come down and you'll be out until things free up. Tests must be able to run in parallel against different parties. This is a best practice, um, and if you're going to be running this many tests, I'd recommend you do it. Down to organizations where they have their test cases laid out in the traditional way. This is step one, this is step 50, and you have to do them in order because there are all these data dependencies which really don't have to be there. Yeah, you want to do a complete walkthrough so the business people are happy, but there's a lot of stuff that can be pre stage to fix it through data parallel. You really want to invest in that to decrease the amount of time it takes to execute your test. You can leverage the elasticity of what you have at the cloud. And you can get your results faster so you can fail faster. And scalability must be designed into the individual tests. I have seen entire testing frameworks halted in one instance's test procedure because they're awaiting our Oracle lock in the database. So you 30 instances of your application with different code bases on it, waiting to be tested. They're all waiting on one table. So one test can finish up the pipeline. You want to design around those bottlenecks. And that may have been good enough in the past because your testing value volume wasn't that high. But now, you have to keep these velocity issues in mind. So what is the role manual testing now that we have so much automated testing. It does not go away. Those awesome manual testers I was talking about earlier who are too slow, they may be slow at pushing the button, but they're much faster at understanding the application than your automated tests are. Because in the end, unless you're developing back-end rest and people are going to be using the system at some point. And the automated test is not going to tell you that you decided to have your background the same color as your text, or it would be very difficult to test for that. But a manual tester will tell you right away, the whole screen's white, what's going on. Scenarios like that are what manual testers are really good for. 
Automated tests are not as effective because they are so specific in a lot of cases. Fuzzing takes a lot of time for a computer. People can go through these combinations a lot faster. Manual testing is now a precious resource that can only be applied in a limited fashion because they cannot keep up with the speed of the pipeline. You're going to give them a release candidate that they're going to stick with for a week so that they can hammer on it and go through it. But that is precious time because you have to be able to select what build you're giving to them, and it has to be of high enough quality that you're okay with it sitting there for a while. <clears throat> time is really what limits manual testing. One or two weeks of testing, level code is written, two or three weeks of total testing effort. Testing effort is often divided. Automation is down. Automation is new functionality testing, spot manual testing. Manual freeform regression testing, these are kind of practices you want to go forward to. Targeted re regression testing based on results. Maybe you do get some automated failures, <coughs> but you really don't care that much about that bit of functionality, so you send in a manual tester to check it out and say, hey, can we, can we live with this if we push this live? Yeah, we're releasing every other day now, so what if it sits for 24 hours? And that somebody, the business, can actually make a decision and say, yeah, yeah, we'll live with it because it's more important that we go live with this functionality than it is that it look great. But what your testing framework has done is it has funneled your manual resources to the problem areas rather than just having this whole landscape of here's the app, go find what's wrong with it. So this is something that I came up with doing this, and I'll actually address some of the technology that Amazon allows uh, to do this. It's called the disposition of systems. You're schooling up and tearing down hundreds of systems now. Test reporting, uh, you want to take, in order to do that, you want to link Jenkins with your cloud provider to produce reports. So you can see all the instances that you have live or dormant because they cost money. You, you need to you know, see what's going on. Um, and with the disposition of systems, with a drill down capability for a cloud provider, you want manual testers to be able to quickly verify their failures. Hey, everything was successful, I tore it down. Okay, what happens when it's not? Well, this is where you're funneling your testers towards problem areas. Getting that dashboard, that information radiator, right, so they can just click on a link and it'll open up the login page for that system or open up a link to that system and then they can come through the test case immediately because they know what test case failed and they know where they have to go in the application. It's a huge time saver. It'll allow reproducibility and verification. Maybe the test was wrong. That's what your manual tester is going to tell you as well. Are my automated tests right? Or are they way off in law law? Be able to quickly get to the source of the problem through the disposition of the system is going to save you time and money when it comes to the testing. The developers must be able to identify broken VMs so that if the functionality is actually broken, they can go in and do root cause analysis. And this is again where the DevOps comes in. That developer is no longer sitting idly waiting for some system engineer to hand him the contact logs so he can trace through megabytes or gigabytes of output to see what went wrong. Now, he gets his butt out of his IDE, clicks on the Jenkins link, gets dropped directly to the shell at the system. And he goes in and he has access to all the logs he needs and he can trace through and figure it out himself quickly. He doesn't have to wait on anyone. That process of sneaker netting logs back and forth is an actual issue that I've run into in almost every client engagement. It pushes out the cycle for root cause analysis to weeks sometimes. It's horrible when we try to do get new code going every other day. So with all this stuff going on at once, you either need you need somebody to do what's called orchestration. So I have to find this myself. Other people in the industry may have done a better job at defining this. But what I call orchestration. The context of this demonstration is the combination of architectural components and services in a meaningful fashion to produce a running system. 
So that means while Chef is great at installing software on a particular machine, if that machine has a dependency to a database over here, it's very hard to script that into the Chef script sitting on this machine. You need to go outside where the current recipe or class is being run and have some sort of overarching review. All my web servers are ready, great. My database backend isn't up yet because I'm loading the initial scheme. What do I do? And your deployment software has to know, well, busy wait on the Tomcat startup so they don't far fall over the logs and the container doesn't come up properly. Stuff like that. For the example I showed you, we had database, and app server, database initialization, and app server initialization, and then a coordinated starting of the database and then the app server to get everything running. This was all handled by Jenkins. I wrote some magic in Jenkins, which can see everything. Jenkins might not necessarily be the best tool. There are, tool. There are other tools out there to do it. But I did it myself. I wrote some scripts with logic in it that looked for the right things at the right time and then allowed the services to be start correct, started correctly. The other way around this is that you can engineer your deployments to deal with not having all the dependencies, uh, which I believe is the best practice. So what I did in industry-wide, or kind of people who do this for real, Google, Netflix, and Amazon, what I did is actually crunch. They would just prefer that <clears throat> whatever component comes up, and it knows what to do as each of its dependencies come up. But that requires a degree of engineering, and a lot of organizations don't have this great Money is always a factor. Every software developer, every system engineer gets a paycheck. Somebody's paying it, and people want to know what they're getting for their value. And this is where you run into velocity versus cost. You have the cloud. Amazon will let you instantiate an almost infinite number of resources in their cloud, but they expect you to pay the bill for the month. So internally, there are some things that you should think of when you're doing um, Velocity comes with parallelism, so you need to know how fast you need to run through your test case. Um, code is being tested in a pipeline fashion, so to get parallelism, you have some efficiencies. Uh, by doing things at the same time. So now the question is how much velocity? So we're getting to the cost. So as a rule of thumb, the number of the cost is the number of testing machines is infrastructure. Your CI infrastructure is full. Because those instances are going to be relatively static. The number of parallel instances times machines per instance and storage. Amazon not only charges you for running your machines, they charge you for all your disk space, right? So this is just a good rule of thumb. Rule of thumb. That will give you an approximate cost. Amazon's cost model is actually extremely complicated, and their trusted advisor is actually a program that will help you figure that out. Uh, same with Google Compute, because you have you pay for network bandwidth, you pay for disk space, you pay for CPU time. Like there are a lot of different variables that go into your code. But overarching, that's the formula you want to use to figure out what to do. And you want to use budget and team size to figure out where to spend the money that I do have. Because even with an infinite amount of money, if you're a team of five, that 400th VM, or that 400th instance in your application, it's likely only giving me very little marginal utility. So what? I can. Every code commit is now spins up an instance in my application. I have people committing five times a minute. You have to look and process all of that data. And no matter how many tools you have in place to do that, there's a human element. And your team has to be able to keep up with that deluge of data. <clears throat> so you have to take a look and budget. Or maybe you do only build once an hour. Maybe you do build every 15 minutes. You just have to deal with what your team is comfortable with and figure that out. It's kind of one of the nice things about Agile, is those things aren't set in stone. You can figure it out on a daily basis, and you do have these keywords like velocity that kind of sort of mesh with the term that we're using here in velocity. 
When money is the constant, the developer or tester habits must now best utilize the limit APIs wisely. You have hard limits on how many times you can run your tests a day because that's just how much money you're given. You want to be more wary of those commits. Data now. <clears throat> We've gone over this already in other sections, but basically, you're going to have a lot of data. You want to drill down to it correctly. And you want to give people access to all the little red bubbles of Jenkins, red signifies problem. And have them know in their debate. When they click on a link, it'll take them right to the problem. And it will save you money and time to make your resources more effective. Sodar Cube. Again, this is, <clears throat> we've gone over this already, but I just wanted to bring up. Sodar Cube. Sodar Cube is really good at visualizing data. Open source product has a lot of default things you can look for. Interacts very well with Maven, Jenkins, and other uh, technologies that will allow you to set automatic thresholds. So you can ask the computer, is my code good enough? It is going. So lastly. That's my speed. Uh, I do get a paycheck, and these are the people who pay me. And I'd like to tell you what we do with this technology, if you're available, for our customers. Uh, we do training and process improvement. Uh, we bring these technologies to other companies who ask for them. They ask for these technologies by their I want to be more agile. I want to do DevOps. And typically what we do is we set up an exemplar project and then we help them transition their other projects to this way of doing things. Organizational change is hard, so that exemplar project is very important. Um, and we show cost savings, benefits, increased code velocity, increased releases, and increased software quality. And the business case usually makes itself popular. Um, our typical thing is we show them the cost of change for a feature in their application and how much lower it is now. We also have the approach of if they don't let us do the exemplar project, we break in pieces of the automated pipeline, the DevOps cycle, slowly. One of the first things we might do is bring chickens to the table, or puppet to the table, or chef to the table, or maybe even maven, because they're doing their builds by hand. Uh, and then we start using these marginal games with focus on just making pieces of the process better and then showing them how if they adopted the whole process, how much better their life would be. And as a company, Cabarrus uh, often likes to take a veteran position. We don't need to own the work. Just give us credit and tell your friends that we thought you how to do it. Oh, yeah. We don't need to be around there forever and ever and ever. But we're happy to teach. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about level of effort. You saw this nice little Jenkins thing. This demonstration needs to be customized for each environment. The target application service could be Windows servers running IIS. Very few projects that I've dealt with are this same. And while this demo could be a guide, it touches all the philosophies of DevOps and continuous integration, continuous delivery. It can't be a generalized solution. The tools are good, but they may not fit your particular niche. Um, this implementation required research into the APIs and inner workings of several complicated tool sets. I don't know, maybe I'm just dumb. Maybe this is all easy for you. I actually spent a lot of time making sure that all of these pieces could talk to each other in a way that they could understand. Things are getting better now because DevOps is becoming more of a buzzword and people are investing it. So some of these things that I actually handcrafted about a year and a half ago when I first offered this demo, they're actually now just plugins for the work. The engineering effort is commensurate with the complexity of the architecture. If all you have is a lamp stack. That's all about my and 
that's your business, you know, maybe it's a highly scalable lab stack, but overall the architecture is not that complicated. Your deployment framework is not that complicated. So we've worked for customers whose environment consists of 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 servers which can run through their application once. And it's Tomcat and it's SQL Server in the Windows world and all these other things that to work together. The more disparate the environment, the more complicated the engineering. Remember, now your deploys are engineered. So this truly brings the developer into the ops part of that box. That said, the more differences you have in the environment, the harder the effort is, especially if you're starting from scratch. In this particular cut of technologies that I use, why did we pick those? Well, the industry is moving its way in various forms. This is just the way I thought to actualize DevOps. AWS has something very interesting called cloud formation templates that do a lot of things. They're not perfect because it relies on shell scripting and a few other things. But what it does do is that bookkeeping we were talking about before. I told you, right now, after running this demo, I have a couple of VMs just sitting out there. Cloud formation templates take care of that. Once the template is decommissioned and you finish your testing, it destroys all the hard drives, all the VMs, all the instances. So while AWS may not be so good at configuring an individual OS, it's great for standing up those templates and the stack as a whole, and then letting Chef do it. <laughs> but there are a bunch of other technologies. They all have the same general Hundreds of VMs, you're going to have to manage your networks as well. You don't have control over your IP space. IP addresses then become your most valuable resource. And if you know one of these cloud providers and you implement this methodology once, it's generally the same. It's different names, but the methodology is different. So, as a presentation, Doug. Open the floor for discussion. Um, I have implemented these processes several large customers, including the Department of Defense and the Department of Integration. So I have some real life war stories if you have any questions. So, how do you, you're putting a lot of weight, the way you're putting it forward to say the developers are the ones defining what's going out there and the ops people just keeps it alive. How do you make sure that those developers are corresponding with all the requirements and you've had all the security and, and, and ops procedures and all that, so whatever they deploy can be maintained? So they're, they have to rely heavily on automated training. So let's take requirements, for example. Start simple, customer requirements. <laughs> this is not a technology thing. This is a methodology thing. And we advise our clients to use test driven development so that you write the test before you write the code. And additionally, you have the user acceptance testing piece if you're doing agile at the end, where the product owner itself is looking over a piece of functionality to make sure it meets his requirements. The product owner is usually the guy writing the checks. So, does it look good? Does it do what I want? And so, that slice is just Having the developers keep the requirements, there are at least two independent bodies. One is a set of automated tests, which you take on a life of their own, even though the developer may have written it, because you have many developers writing these tests. You can actually think of these tests as an independent auditor. And you have the guy who's actually, if you're following Agile, you have the guy who's actually cutting the check, looking over the work at the end of the sprint, to make sure that it's the way he wants. But that's yeah. functional. How do you do compliance? Compliance is the same way. If compliance is deep, a uh, critical piece of the application, let's say you're writing a point of sale and you need PCI compliance, right? Somebody on your scrum or in your Agile team has to have that experience. And he has to write a set of automated tests to make sure you're in compliance or be able to execute the manual tests quickly to make sure you're in compliance. 
So you have to bake that in up in front. And that's engineering. And that's where the DevOps piece comes from. Security is a big one. There are a lot of great tools out there. And while you can never stop at their turn of the hacker, you can at least make sure you're using open SCAP, open DAS, many other open source projects hack, even if you want to pay for a commercial version of Nessus or something else. You can at least make sure that if you get owned, it wasn't for something stupid. <laughs> and those tests can be run every week. And you can see what your vulnerability is. You don't have to guess it. Thanks. This is more of a comment. It seems like you really have to, people that have to have people that keep their eye on the ball. You get one little diagnostic down here in your 100,000 line log file. And the thing quits at some point, you know, and with your introduction, you're like, oh, we didn't see that. We didn't look at it. Yeah. We have, uh, when something fails, it screams, literally, on the dashboard. And it's hard to miss. And we have typically four people dedicated to just making sure the pipeline is running smoothly. So we have four multiple people at our current engagement who are taking turns just watching the pipeline and fixing whatever issues they can as fast as possible to keep the continuous piece of continuous integration. So yeah. It also seems like for root cause analysis, if you're actually running on a VM, you know, in production, and those guys change it, <laughs> how do you know? So this is one of the reasons. A lot of variables, a lot of moving parts here. This is one of the reasons we want to invest in something like Puppet or Chef. Part of what I didn't mention here is this idea of deployments, <laughs> and this is the fact that your deployment scripts, you should be able to, if you follow best practices, run them an infinite amount of times, and it will only ever alter the system if it's in a state that you don't want it to be. Puppet. You can choose the run interval, the default is every two minutes. And we have had this problem. Somebody monkeys around, some ops person monkeys around with one of your images. If Puppet is running on the interval, it will correct the changes like that. And if you built those rest on the class properly, it will restart all of your services appropriately. So your system is only down maybe for two minutes. And you didn't have to do anything to get that for free. But we had one where some system operator he was involved with the security people, went in and locked down the permissions on the slash Etsy directory. Everything ground to a halt. Yeah, puppet apply, everything was working again. And one doing that on temp and everything can go into a halt. So. Yeah. <laughs> Changes are fun. Yeah. So Go through your iteration. At some point, you need to production, correct? Yes. So, is this still used then for incremental updates to production? <clears throat> that depends on your maturity. Uh, I would advocate that it is. And <clears throat> a lot of work has to be done to reach the level of maturity that Netflix or Google has. The biggest problem. The people who have originated their software out of, let's say, the waterfall model of development, they're used to outages to do their deploys. So if I have multi-tiered architecture, where I have maybe a business intelligence layer, layer, a database layer, and a front end layer, if I change the front end layer to be updated, it may no longer have the correct bindings to talk to the business intelligence layer or the database layer. So this is why DevOps is important. Those developers who used to be removed from the deployment process are now an integral part of it. So now the DevOps guy sitting next to the developer, the developer says, I've made a UI change, and I've changed my process. I've upgraded Angular JS 2.0, and all this stuff is different now. The DevOps guy sitting next to him can say, no, don't do that. You'll ruin our ability to do live deploys. Let's come up with a plan to get these changes staged so they work properly. So 
there's a lot of developer maturity that comes with doing live incremental updates. That said, by leveraging this technology, you can severely shrink the size of the maintenance window. We took a maintenance window from three hours of people banging on the keyboard down to five minutes of demo. Are we as mature as Google? Can we do live updates? No. But when you're coming from three hours, showing your business five minutes of downtime for the next major release is a huge victory. Because and the increment, you can then make the case to sell the incremental updates. So this is real world scenario. I don't want to release every week because you have to experience three hours of downtime. But what if I could make the downtime five minutes? Well, you live in a dream world. Well, the last deploy took five minutes. Okay, we'll release every week now. So we incrementally release every week. This is unusual in federal space. It happens, but not a lot that I've seen. But they were blown away. And so now, expensive, small changes that used to be expensive are now cheap. Oh, you have a text error? Ah, we'll fix it next week. Oh, you have a bad version here, or the form looks a little off? Oh, great, we'll fix it next week. And those incremental changes have uh, given the program a degree of success uh, because now security, the security guy will come with the stack of vulnerabilities and say, ha, if you don't fix these, I'm going to shut you down. And by the time the stack hits the desk, I'm like, okay, we're done. So do you have a new stack? Or are we done here? And they're completely going away by that level of being able to do it. I know just through the presentation, you referenced CI. Yes. So your configuration items, correct? No, continuous integration. So that means. <laughs> Way too many acronyms. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I apologize for not defining them up front. That means that <clears throat> I have an automated build uh, and some sort of test framework. Uh, where building, is, building and producing deployment artifacts is no longer a manual process. Okay, so I guess final question then. So, if you're going to production, do you have to integrate either in the discovery process or CI? Right. Right. Or the continuous, uh, I guess, in production, it's not as much, but the continuous change in machines coming up and down. If you have any type of monitoring system, it has to be integrated into this as well. So you'd be aware that, you know, hey, it's okay that that system just got destroyed because I don't need to worry about it. I've got six others that I need to know about that I don't. So, so let me tell you some dirty little secrets. Uh, you actually highlighted a current flaw in the system I work at now. The power did. Use the full elasticity of EC2 and start standing up and tearing down instances. I have people at the network operations center that storm down my door and shoot me because alarms would be going off, watch officers would be called. They think we're under some sort of cyber attack, even though you know I'm just expanding or contracting the system's capacity. Uh, but most cloud providers allow you a way to deal with this fluidly. fluidly. If you pay for it, AWS's CloudWatch is one. Uh, there are other systems out there. Also, your monitoring systems can be adapted to understand what's going on if you invest in a more modern flood like New Relic, which we have invested in but haven't completed the figure yet because it's very complicated. New Relic. Monitoring tool. Monitoring tool. Oh, yes. <clears throat> uh, so just to give you a, a real life story, Amazon is cheap compared to a lot of other things, uh, especially if you do some pay up front and do that reserve instances. Just to give you an idea, it was so cheap that the department that I worked for got the bill for the first set of pilot programs that we did to prove that technologically it could work. And they then, I'll, I'll get there in a second. They then 
handed down a directive from the CIO level that said, for this program, move all machines there. It was a lot. There's a lot of stuff. They're like, move it all. They're like our current cloud, cloud provider, not so good. This is way better, way faster, and cheaper. They're like, all right, but that's a lot of data. No problem. They went out, they bought two OC12s to connect directly to Amazon from their data center so we can ship everything. That is not cheap. And they are still ahead of the game. Yes. <laughs> True. Uh, and that will give you machine health, which is awesome, uh, because that will tell you, you know, memory utilization, a lot of vital statistics about the operating system. But also tools like New Relic let you uh, check to see if the application itself is healthy. And the only way to do that is sometimes to send a fake person into the system and start traversing some of the functionality. Uh, so you, you need a balance of both. But to your point, like AWS's CloudWatch, I believe, does that. You can literally grab the IO cache statistics if you turn on that five query level monitor and see what's going on. In the scenario, I don't understand in the scenario where you have over a thousand customers working using your application, you have to like, apply zero data to your own machine. Tear down all your VMs and redeploy everything. It depends. So this depends on your maturity and how you want to do disposable computing. For some people, that's not a problem. So then what you have to do is you have to make a decision. So if the engineering effort you know because of your experience or whatever limitations you have that you can't fully engineer the disposable computing solution, which let me tell you, there's a huge barrier to that because you have to change the way the developers think and you have to change that whole of a lot of the ways other people think. There's a human element there that takes time off. Better off if you have that much of an engineering cliff to jump off of. You're better off spending that time and effort engineering your chef and puppet scripts to be able to handle the zero day apply on a machine as is. And actually, uh, a lot of my clients have done that instead. So, chef runs, updates the machine, it knows what services to restart because you program that functionality in, you can update the entire fleet at once. Or, you know, maybe in rolling stages, depending on how you have a cluster and you load balancing stuff. Yeah. Other questions? Well, I guess it stopped raining. We've got more people here. <laughs> yeah. I would like to say thank you, everybody, for your for your time and letting me talk. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, last words from anyone? Okay, so far. Uh, one of the last oh, again, I want to say thanks to Glenn. Oh, pretty good. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, just a note for some people that don't necessarily come here on a regular basis, uh, the maker fear that the last sponsor is tomorrow at South Lakes. Um, it is 30. Um, and yeah. they are also looking for some